I have with me in the studio uh, the governmental candidate of uh, APC, uh, in one of the northwestern states, uh, Katsina State, Dr. Umaru Diko Reda. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Katsina, Katsina State, one of the prime states in the southwest of Nigeria, has been in the news for a lot of reasons, good and bad. Poverty, uh, banditry, insecurity, all manners of issues. Uh, this is a state you seek to drive its affairs. Isn't that a huge challenge? Yes, it is. I'm not doubting you, but uh, someone has to take up the challenge. Someone has to do it. Someone has to seek for the office. Someone must be a governor in the state. So for that reason, those challenges may not deter us from the from seeking for the office. Uh, the issue is, what do we have on ground to tackle all these issues? Because before I even aspire to become the governor, but when people start asking me to be here for the seat of governorship, and I now peruse it, I said, okay, I will not go and aspire for governorship without having a blueprint, a strategic policy. So immediately I dropped some people, experts, we did some survey in Kazuna. We found out those issues that are touching the lives of the people. And then we said, okay, what do we do to solve all these problems? First of all, we draw the strategic policy. We look at areas. The major area we looked at is the insecurity, which is a major challenge. A child cannot go to school if there is no security. You don't go to the market if there is insecurity. You don't go to the hospital without security. So it means the security is the backbone. And this insurgency that is affecting our people came within some years. It has metamorphosed, metamorphosed into an issue. Before there was issue of planning, farmers clash. There were so many issues associated with planning happening, and there are so many issues that has to do with the farmers. And then these issues we allowed it to continue, and it has now metamorphosed into these criminal activities due to some factors. We were facing a lot of issues. The planning has now. We are having a lot of extortion from the traditional institution, from the police, from the Sharia courts, and the rest of it. So in the circumstances where most of them cannot be able to do what they were used to do, we now resort to stealing, blocking roads, and it has now become a very big crime deal that they are now killing, kidnapping, and all sorts of manners. Because if you go to those villages, they can tell you those people who are responsible for these things. The issue of foreigners and the rest of it is not true. Hmm. Even if there are some pocket of foreigners who are conniving with them, but the pocket of them, the over 80% of them to 90% are local people, are local people that we are living with. Because if you go to those places, they will name even those people responsible for. So what's keeping it going? What's keeping what it going? What is keeping it going is because it's lucrative. It's lucrative. If you can just kidnap one person and get 30 to 20 million, what stops people? So they started recruiting people from the locality to give them information on people. They started recruiting even within the security architecture. Because Are you saying this for a fact? Of course. Because how many people were interviewed and they have mentioned so many things. So what has, why has nothing happened to those people? Because there are, you can't pinpoint who. Because there is connivance with the locals. You may not know your younger brother may be part of them. With the promise that you will get some money. Maybe a younger brother will go and tell those people that, look, my brother has money, kidnap him, or kidnap his son. He has money, you will get money. It has happened so many times. We have interviewed so many of them. We have seen a situation that has been interviewed. We have seen a situation whereby a wife connived with the bandit and they kidnapped the mother of the husband. 
we have seen how far it has gone. So if money is involved, as long as ransom will be paid, as long as people, if they are kidnapped, there will be money exchange to regain their freedom, this thing, it will take a very long time before it stops. Okay. Um, doctor, I, I know I, I've followed some of your activities since this campaign started. And I, 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 I can say with certainty that you're kind of clear-minded about what you want to do and what are the challenges. Yeah. I've listened to you a lot. Yeah. But something strikes me, and I've had that also said about you, that your approach to this whole enterprise is too academic. No, not academic, uh, because, look, people don't understand who I am. Mm. First of all, look at background. Mm. I came from a traditional institution. My father was the head of the village I came from. So I know all those intricacies that happen within the traditional institution. And I, I started as a classroom teacher mm. in a village for 10 years. <laughs> so I know what it takes to mingle within the society. And again, I was a local government chairman, mm. a grassroots politician for that matter. I started my politics from a polling booth. And I'm still a grassroots politician because I don't believe in the politics of the elite. Mm. In Abuja, shouting, calling people names, making money in the comfort of the city rooms. I don't do that. I'm always in the village with the people talking to them, mingling with them, trying to know. That is why I had a different approach to my campaign in 2023 election. Because I visited 361 wards in Katana State. The tradition is for the gubernatorial candidates to visit local government headquarters. But I opt to go to all the, all the, all the wards in the state, 361, and I was able to finish it in the last two weeks. And I have gone to even places where it's a no-go area, people don't go. Even security has advised us not to go. But I choose to go because people are living there and I want to govern those people. And if I want to govern them, I need to know where they are, how they are living. And if should anything happen to me, I'm doing it in the course of taking responsibility. Hmm. Leadership is not a joke and it's an issue of responsibility. You have to take the bulls by the horn and try to approach the issue in a more civilized way than how it used to be before. So that is why nobody can tell me that, yes, I have a PhD, but that does not make me an uh, academic approach. But because if you look at our strategic policy, are all implementable policies. Because we even design an implementation matrix of our strategic policies. We are not just doing it on paper, thinking that it will work. No. Is this something you, you, you're confident you can push through being governed? Is this something you're confident? Yes, I know there should be a lot of challenges with people because people are not used to that kind of approach. Hmm. People are used to a lot of traditional way of doing things. My, my approach to governance is not approach of entirely 24 hours in the office. I will make sure that I spend more time in the field than in the office. Because the more you stay in the office, the more you make everybody to relax. Hmm. I should be able to be in this ministry today, in the next ministry today, in an emergency tomorrow, and I put aside next day to see things for yourself. Because when I went around all the 361 was, I was able to see things that if you tell me, I will not believe it. Hmm. before my visit. So it has opened my eyes and seeing is bleeding. Hmm. And you see problems with your own eyes. You are, not, you are not going to wait at somebody in the office to bring a problem, distorted one, before it comes to your table. But I have seen it myself. I have seen how people are suffering. I have seen how some places are turned into a miserable places. Towns that have been very beautiful before that have turned out to be uh, something else. You can see hunger in some people when you see them. So this is something that we will not take it lightly. We will try to do justice. We will try to be transparent. I, I, can, I can feel the, the, the passion and, uh, with which you are approaching this. 
can you make a commitment to, to us that this passion will not win when there are laws of office get into you if but get into I think the only commitment I will give you is this the press has a lot of responsibility to make sure that there is good governance and transparency in every administration and follow up to the strategic policies of policy makers. Mm. I'm challenging you also <laughs> to follow us as we move on, if we are sworn in today, mm. follow us through and see the kind of things that we are and let's come back to this table and let's chat. That would happen. I mean, as we wrap up this conversation, Let's look at some of the national issues and how it impinges on one, the campaign in, in Katsina and, and governorship, governance in Katsina. Let's take the Naira redesign uh, and, and the swap of old to new, new notes. A lot of politicians have complained about it. Are you one of those complaining about that policy? How is it affecting the people in your domain? It's a two-way thing. There is good side of the policy, there is bad side of the policy. The good side of the policy is you are trying to move money from the informal sector to the formal banking sector. And once there is money, liquidity within the banking, uh, banking cycle or banking sector, there will be more money to borrow, there will be more money for productivity than one money are outside because it is only one money are inside the formal banking sector that it can be used effectively for the development of any nation. But the second bad side of it is you can't mop up money without making money available the new redesign may or not. The problem we are having today uh, money is not available in the banking hall. The money is not available. The cash policy law says that you can be able to withdraw 500000 as an individual within a week. Let there be 500000 for you as an individual when you walk into the banking hall as long as you have it in your account. They say the corporate account can withdraw up to five million in a week. Let there be five million for that corporate account if you demand it and if you have it in your account. But we are in a situation whereby if you demand for five million, you get two thousand in the banking hall. How do you expect people to live with this kind of situation? Especially in Nigeria that our most of our trading is informal sector, is not the formal. And for you to achieve cashless policy, you must ensure that, that you have three things in place. You have power, you have telecommunication, you have the banking infrastructure. Take example of my state, Kazana. We have 34 local governments in Kazana, but only 10 local governments had banks, branches. And out of those 10 local governments, only six has branches in more than one, has, has more than one branch in the local government. So you can imagine that a state that has 10 million people uh, approximately, with only 10 local governments with banking infrastructure, and only six local governments with more than one branch. So you can imagine how the commotion, the commotion, and the problem that may arise as a result of the policy. The most, just as the way the Council of State have said it, make the money available. Mm. If you make the money available, there is no so wrong with the cash policy. Cash policy is good for the Nigerian economy, it's good for us as a nation, it's good for us for the development of our economy, but make it available as the law provides. Mm. You can move up 2.7 trillion and make available only 300 billion. It will never work and people will suffer and can lead into crisis, both economy and social crisis in the nation. Yeah, I was just to, uh, about to ask you what, 
what do you see as moving forward? What is the consequence of what has happened and how can we redress it? These two issues will happen definitely if it has not been taken care of. Now it will be social crisis and economic crisis in the country. But the only way to address it make this money available when you need it in accordance to the law. Let's wrap this conversation up. There have been talks, not official, about speculations about interim government. Do you see the election holding? What's your response or reaction to the talks around interim government? I think the president is very clear on this. The president has said it over and over that he's going to hand over to the next elected civilian government come May 29, 29th May. So I think we believe in President and we believe in his own words and we have heard the chairman of INEC telling us that the election will come and I believe in what they said and I knew Nigerians are ready for the election with NERA or without NERA no. <laughs> with the design or without the design people are ready and eager to vote for the new leaders and I'm sure the President is a student of this political process he has learned the in and out of this political process. He is a genuine democrat. He has been following the constitution religiously than any other person who has led this country before. And I think the president will still hold his word. There will be election. And Nigerians will not even, uh, will not even accept uh, any interim government for now. I'm telling you. Oh, people special. are ready for election and people must vote and their vote must count and we will have new government come 20 years. The chances are so bright <laughs> and what I have seen when I went around yes. 361 local government, it makes me very comfortable that APC is going to win because on a landslide and because people are looking at the quality of the leadership. People are looking at the quality of candidates. If you go to Katana today, people are not even talking about ABC, PDP, NNPP, or anything. People are talking about quality of the leaders that are candidates in those political parties. And I believe APC has more better qualified candidates than any other party in the state, in whatever ramification. Well, thank you very much um, for sharing your time. and. It's been quite insightful. Thank you so very much. Thank you.